Well, I started in show business when I was four years old. You see, I was born in 1929 and I caused the depression. <laughs> I'm not joking, everything went right downhill from there. So I lost my mother and I was adopted by this couple who were old enough to be my grandparents, and what do you do with the cutest little thing around? You put her to work, which was fine. I mean, I'm not complaining. It's what you did way back then, and this was way back when. So I was at four years of age. My first job was in Midsummer Night's Dream, and I was a fairy. You think there's a theme here? And then I did our gang comedies. I did 37 major motion pictures. And I was usually the blur, you know, that went by. I doubled Elizabeth Taylor on National Velvet. And I was a dancer from the very beginning. So I fell in love with television. And I am so old that I was experimental television, WXYZ and WXAO, which turned out to be KECA or ABC Network. And I worked for them and I had my own show on television. So that to me was so great because you know what? When you're working in the movies, you get over there at the cold morning you get your makeup on, you sit all day in a dark sound stage, and if you're lucky, you get two minutes of film in the camera. It is so boring, I can't tell you. And I was part of the generation that wanted to move things faster. Well, television was live, and it was very interesting. I tell you, uh, I did the Charlie Ruggles show, which was one of the first family network shows on ABC for five years. And you know what they had us doing in one of the, uh, to start with? We not only were doing the show live, we did the commercials live. And no one had ever heard of a cue card at that time. So what sort of changed the whole idea was <clears throat> they gave me the job, and I'm standing, and we had Dr. Ross dog food. His dog gone good. Woof. That was our sponsor. So I'm standing there, and this is a time also, when whatever women said didn't mean anything. It really didn't mean anything. And so the line I was supposed to give on this commercial at the beginning of this live show was, my father thinks Dr. Ross dog food is the best for our dog. My brother thinks Dr. Ross dog food is the best for our dog. And so do I. You know, so I go up there and I stand and I'm, doing the talking, and I get to the end, and I said, my dad likes Dr. Ross food, my brother likes Dr. Ross food, and so do I. And you know, they never asked me to do a commercial again. <laughs> so we got Hal Smith. Any of you watch the Andy Griffith Show? Yes, you know um, Otis Campbell? Well, he was, uh, he's the one Hal Smith came on board to do the commercials, and that's the first time that I met a Hal who became a family friend. So I'm doing, I'm doing big things on TV. I have my own television show, I'm doing a radio show, doing a local show. And uh, out of the ABC show, I get a call from my agent saying, brace yourself, they are looking for a model for a three and a half inch Sprite who does not talk at Disney Studios? I went, Disney Studios? I still do it to this day. I live about a mile away from Disney Studios. It's one of the most exciting places to go to. And But if you were working in the business at that time, Disney Studios, I mean, that was just the best. And so I got a, an okay. I was working at Fox, and they gave me the day off to go the next day and try out for this. I was assistant dance director at Fox. And so I thought, what do I do? I mean, you just don't walk in and say, hi, I'd like a job, and I'd like to be this fairy that you're talking about, and hire me. You know, you don't do that. You do something clever, right? So I had a 45 record. Any of you remember with the big holes in the middle? And it was an instrumental. So I choreographed fixing a, a nine-year-old boy fixing breakfast. And it went something like this. I'll just show you a little tiny piece of it. Ha <laughs> ha 
And Mark Davis said, would it be convenient for you to come to work next Tuesday? And that's how I got the job. And the next thing that I did, and I will show you what the first scene that I did. Now, when they say, would it be convenient? I never heard of this before. It was always be there at a certain time, you know, sit still, get your hair done, whatever it was. And they said, would it be convenient next Tuesday? And I went, something's wrong here. And I said, of course. And they said, what time would you like to come? I went, they're kidding me, you know? I said, uh, 10 o'clock. They said, fine, be in hairdressing. So they did my hair up, as you saw in the DVD, with a little knot on top. And I wore my bathing suit, my one piece. I had two of them. And that's all I wore the whole time with the cover up, my dears. You didn't walk around in a bathing suit. You wore a cover-up. So anyway, I got, got over there, and they said, this is the scene that we want Tinkerbell to do. Well, before I stepped out in front of the camera with Mark Davis, who was one of the nine old men of Disney, he designed not only Tinkerbell, he designed Flower and Thumper, he designed uh, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, Haunted Mansion, Cruella de Vil. I, I, you know, the list can go on. He was my director. And he would sketch these things out and show me what he wanted him to do. So I stepped out in front of the camera and I said, Mr. Davis, I, you see how old I am? You called everybody Mr. You did call my first name, you know, like, hi, Mark. So anyway, I said, what do you want? Do you want her to be ditzy like Betty Boop? Or do you want her to be above it all like a queen of the fairies? And he said, Margaret, we want her to be you. And I thought for a minute, I said, golly gee, I think I can do that. <laughs> so I had read up on Tinkerbell, and I felt that she was about anywhere from 9 to 11 years of age. And the scene that we first did, and I will do it for you, you saw a piece of it on there, was that she's landing on the mirror. And she's looking at herself. Now, I played it as if she had never seen a mirror before. Because in James M. Barry's book, the first time that Peter finds her in the nursery, he says, Tank, where are you? And you know where she was? She was inside a jug. She had never seen a jug before. And so she was having a lovely time. So I thought, she had never seen a mirror before. So let me just do that little piece. We don't have any music behind it, but you can hum a little bit. Unfortunately, in this day and age, they have taken that wonderful still that you have seen so often and turned it into that she was preening, that she was so taken with herself. I didn't think she was at all. I did a double take, and of course they changed it that she was in love with Peter. Tinkerbell was never in love with Peter. If you read the book, and I hope that you do, Tinkerbell is a groupie. She wants to go on the adventures, and she thinks that big, ugly old girl 
may go, go with Peter instead of her. And that's what she's upset about. Peter never loved Wendy. As you, if you read it again in the, in the part that says, Peter got this look on his face as he says, Wendy, uh, you know, the lost boys, we don't have anybody to tuck us in at night, and, and, and we don't have anybody to sing to us, and, and we don't even have any pockets. And, and if you came, you could so I he manipulated her. And once he got her to Neverland, he abandoned her at the lagoon. So we have put so much on this, and it was so simple in, in the time when it was done. Uh, so I did all of these scenes, and I must tell you, you saw the, the DVD when you saw the first animation of the pencil drawing. That was the first time that I saw her, and do you know that they were upset? Many of the people in the studio were upset with her because they thought she was too curvy. The upper part of her body is like a little girl and the bottom part of her body is like a woman. And they said, we can't have that in a Disney movie. We just, it won't work, it won't animate, it won't, et cetera, et cetera. And so I went to the first time to, to the projection room to see her, to actually see her animate. Can you imagine? Can you get the feeling that I had? I had been working with her now for maybe three months. I had never seen her animated. And I'm sitting here in the middle of this crowded projection room, and it was jammed, and I'm hearing all this conversation. Well, it's not, you know, uh, Mark Davis may have to change this, that, and the other, and so on. And so, and I'm ready to do battle, but I don't even know the words they're using. But, you know, and then the lights go down, and I look up on the screen. And there she is, animated. And I thought she was the dearest thing that ever got up on the screen. And I threw it up to the people behind me and I said, so there. <laughs> <laughs> and I sat down again. And they played it again and again. And I want to tell you a lovely thing about what happened with, with uh, Walt Disney while we're in the projection room. The, the people were leaning against the walls. That's how full it was. And uh, as I'm waiting for this, everything to go dark to see it, I hear a door open. And I hear this voice say, oh, here, Walt, take my chair, my seat. And I heard the, the Midwestern voice said, no, you were here on time, I'm fine. I couldn't believe it because every place else that I had worked, you know, there was beautiful chairs with ribbons over them that said VIP. And if you ever sat in them, I mean, you would be right out the... And here he was as casual as could be. Well, after we finished it, I got up and, and started walking. And of course, I had tears in my eyes. And everybody would say, well, she's adorable. She's, she's, she's really just absolutely adorable. Maybe the top is cut a little bit too low on her dress, but no. If you read the book, James M. Barry says that her dress is cut to effect, and it's cut quite low in the front and clings to her quite lovely body. I mean, he followed everything that they said. So anyway, I was just on seventh heaven, in seventh heaven, and I went on my way doing all kinds of other things at the same time. And I wonder what the next thing that I'm going to tell you. So you'll have to wait until I look at my, at my because anything I tell you is brilliant, by the way. I just thought you'd like to know. Okay, so uh, I was on the sound stage, and... Uh, because I didn't have anything to say. You remember in the first two movies, she didn't talk. She just, it was animation and uh, um, all of her actions and what she was doing. So we had the great big huge door open with the sun shining through to keep it warm. And that's, that's the ones where the trucks came in. And I looked up and here came a group of men who were shadows. And they were walking in, and they were walking over by the wall, about as far away as that wall is over there. And one of them, you could just tell by a shadow, it was Buddy Ebsen. He walked so funny. I mean, he has no bones. 
And so you knew it was him. And then they were working on a project which turned in to animatronics. That's what they were trying to plan. And I got to look and see what was going on. And then they would leave. And this one figure would come walking across over to talk to Mark Davis and Jerry Geronimi and the cameraman. And I looked and it was Walt Disney. And they're saying to me, come on, come on over. Margaret, come on over. And I didn't have my cover up. <laughs> and I was not going to meet Walt Disney without my cover up. So I finally got it and I, got, I went over and I'm standing there and he was very nice. Couldn't have been nicer, much slimmer than I thought and very handsome, much more so than the photos that I have seen of him since. So uh, he's talking to me and somebody had told him that I had mentioned I went to school with both of his daughters, Sharon and Diane. I went to a girl's school and the reason being is you could get a permit to get out to work. If you went to a public school, it still is today. It is very, very, very difficult. So you went to a girls' school, and they were only there for one year. But anyway, he said to me, I understand you went to school with my girls. I, <laughs> uh, yep. Yep. Uh-huh. And, and <laughs> I wish I could tell you I was brilliant, but I wasn't. I just, it was so amazing to me. And he stepped away, and he came back and said something like, I think they must have liked you. You know, I, uh, uh, yep. <laughs> but the serendipity, and the other thing was, as I said before, or I mentioned, I think, that I was seeing the head of a studio. Do you realize that in a studio, to see the head of a studio was almost impossible? And when they did come, everything stopped. And over at Fox, Georgie Jessel walked in where we were doing the big dance number. Everything stopped. The buzz went on. I thought he had trumpeters in front of him, you know? Boss of studio coming. And the dancer who was standing next to me, she says, do we curtsy? <laughs> but that's the way you felt. And here was the head of the studio, which I thought was more, actually, than meeting Walt Disney. I was amazed at that. Uh, on the uh, other side of it was, as we went going and we finished it and we did the picture and it was a big hit and all the rest, the rumor mill started that it was Marilyn Monroe who was the model for Tinkerbell. Well, it makes sense. She's curvy. She, I worked with Marilyn. I have an unpublished photo that's coming out in my book with her. She was adorable. I loved her. Everybody around loved her. But the difference was that Marilyn was not a dancer at that time. And Tinkerbell called for a dancer. Let me show you. <laughs> See the difference? So that's why the part needed a dancer. Well, my kids got pretty sick of finding out people were saying that Tinkerbell did it. I mean, Marilyn Monroe did it. That And uh, Trivial Pursuit even printed it. They sent a letter to the archives, and Dave Smith sent out the word, it was little old me and not Marilyn. I, I still have that letter, if you can imagine. It's cold up here. I've got to put my shoes back on. Okay. Now, we're getting to the part. How are we doing with time? Just great. How's that for balance for an 86-year-old? Huh? Don't want to skip it. Yes, it's question and answer. And because I am 86 years old, I, and I have tinnitus, I worked for 12 years at KKLA Christian Talk Radio, the flagship of Salem Communications, had my own show for 10 and a half years called Ministry Loves Company. 
and I was my engineer, and I got tinnitus from feedback. So my hearing is not sensational, but it's better than most. So if you're going to ask me a question, and I hope you are, and if I don't have the answer, I'll make it up, so don't worry about that. Uh, please, um, you know, come up here and ask. Oh, we've got a microphone. Does it, is it hot? Okay, please, if you would, I'd appreciate it. Uh, there comes one bold soul. That's great. There's Tink. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. How would you have felt if um, Tinkerbell would have been a realistic movie instead of an animation? A little louder, please. If how would you have felt if Tinkerbell would have been an, a realistic movie instead of animation? I never thought about that. <laughs> I would have had to fly on pulleys, <laughs> and I would have bumped into walls. And I would have been <laughs> dropped. Nope, thank you very much. <laughs> Animation, and I always look my, you know, I have to tell you, I said one time to Mark Davis, um, Mr. Davis, do you realize that her underwear is showing all the time? And she seems to be the only one who has it, and you know how he answered? Did you notice it's always clean? So. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I want it animated. Thank you very Thank much. You. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, considering how you had thought about Tinkerbell and the opinions of others, how do you feel about the Tinkerbell series? Because it shows that she has genuine curiosity about everything, that she had the lost things, and oh my gosh, the Tinkerbell, blah, blah, blah. The, so the seven, you're talking about the seven movies that they made yeah, with like the, the fairies? The yeah, the, the cartoons. Well, um, I have mixed feelings. First mm -hmm. of all, they took her curves away. Mm -hmm. uh, That's true. <laughs> however, uh, it is a prequel, mm -hmm. and I love it because when I was talking to them about, i over there quite often, and I would pose for them about these different things, uh, they would tell me that each one had a lesson to, to teach and how subtle it was and how delightful and they were putting everything in it. And John Lasseter was uh, who oversaw all the storylines. He made sure that all of this was happening. But my problem was and is I never thought of Tinkerbell living in a room. Really? I never thought of Tinkerbell working five, uh, nine to five. I never thought of Tinkerbell having a supervisor. I don't care how cute she was. <laughs> I just thought of her as a much more of a free uh, Spirit? fairy, yeah. you know, out in there. But it worked, and of course we know that one of the reasons that they had those films is they needed new product, <laughs> Disney needed new product. <laughs> I never thought I'd say that. Anyway, uh, because of the fairies that they had to mix them together with her, mm -hmm. and I must say, they never ever got those fairies more popular than Tinkerbell. Mm -hmm. I was always it. Yeah. Because <laughs> you're brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. Absolutely. Nice. And you know that there's a new live movie I can hardly wait to. Reese Witherspoon, whom I adore, is doing a live one, and she's playing mm -hmm. Tink. Oh, Won't that be interesting? So <laughs> yes. thank you for the question. No, thank you for answering. Okay. Hello uh, there. Hi, Tinkerbell. Hi. How will I be able to be part of a Disney movie or a TV show? Could you repeat that? Just a, I'm thinking while he's repeating it is what I'm doing. <laughs> okay, one more time. Okay, how should I do something to be part of a Disney movie or TV show? Ah, well, one of the best ways to do it is you know that they're hiring all over the country. You don't have to go exactly to Disneyland or to Walt Disney World. But as in anything, if you want to be an actor, you go and immerse yourself where the people are. For example, my husband whom I married, my second husband, decided he wanted to be an actor. And he was gorgeous. He looked like Sean Connery, only older. Uh, just a beautiful, couldn't act his way out of a paper bag. <laughs> but he was beautiful. And so I told him about Backstage West, 
where you have uh, uh, calls that they need people to do movies for free, student films and so on and so forth to do it. So he went uh, and, and worked and got his head shot and did all of these things. And guess who he ended up with? Doing um, a um, student film for Michael Bay, the great producer. And he was wonderful in it. And Michael also asked if I would do a, a part in it too. Well, Michael Bay, when he went right to work, remembered my husband, called him, and we did a musical video with uh, a Poco. And then he called him to do two more films with him, not, sp not speaking parts. But, <laughs> but he knew that my husband was not a flake and would show up. You'd be surprised, about 65% of the actors in Hollywoods are flakes and don't even show up after they've gotten the part. It's, it's an amazing thing. So you immerse yourself in what you want. If you want Disney, you start in with a park. You know, there's something for you to do. And that's an easy entrance to do. And it's the same way if you want to act, if you want to write, anything like that. Find that group because they will remember you and they will hire you when they get ahead or you will hire them when you get ahead. Okay? okay Good answer? Yes. And it's true. It's the way to do it. Hello, Mr. Batman. Hey, Tink. <laughs> uh, I have two questions for you. <laughs> Quick questions. First one is, how, how hard is it to act without saying any words at all, especially for a character like Tink, where she has a lot of emotions? Well, if you're not an actress, um, it's hard. Yes. But being an actress and a pantomimist and a dancer, it's sort of joined together. It's either you have the flair for it or you don't. And you get the character and you do it, for example, uh, instead of if she's looking at something that surprises her, uh, instead of going, you know, it's like, oh! I really didn't say anything, but you know what I'm thinking. Yeah. So when that's your business and that's your job, you should be able to do it rather easily. And you, you, you worked with the Three Stooges. How was that like? I say again? When you worked with the Three Stooges, how was that like? Oh, I got to get into the Three Stooges right after the um, uh, question and answer. Okay, oh. we'll hold that. All okay. right, thank you. Thank you, Tink. Um, do, 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 do. I wish I knew the theme song for Batman. <laughs> um, hi, Tinkerbell. Um, if you had a chance to go back in time when you were acting out um, the scenes for Tinkerbell and working for Walt, would you go back? I would think of the pimples. <laughs> because I'd be about 19 and it, it was too hard. <laughs> But to, uh, I work there, I go there, I see the people there, and you get the same flavor. That was a very smart aleck remark from me, and I'm sorry, I shouldn't have answered that way. <laughs> but, it's, but it's true. Tinkerbell never looks back, and I have never looked back in 86 years, except one time. And I'll just break in to tell you, I told you I was adopted, when I was uh, 52, I got a contract with the state of California to produce an animated film, 15 minutes, of an earthquake. It was called A Quake, Don't Let It Shake You. And I was asked by a friend of mine to come on local television and talk about what you should have in the house, right? So everything is fine. And this lady comes zipping by at CBS and she says, I think I found my birth mother. <clears throat> and I. I said, what was that all about? There was a lady who was on who had helped people. I said, I'm adopted. They gave me the name of this lady, and I found my whole family 50 years after I lost them. So it, I would never look back. It was a door had opened, and I love serendipity. I, I love the good Lord who does this, and I love that he opens up my eyes to say, hey, I did that for you. Shape up, you know? But I did. I found my whole family, and I found out I was Irish. <laughs> and I like that. So, no, I don't go back, and I think that's what we love about Tinkerbell. She doesn't go back either. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> hey, Tink. 
Hi there. Hi. All right. So my question for you is, other than Tinkerbell, obviously, do you have another uh, favorite character that you enjoy watching? Well, uh, if I may, um, my favorite Disney movie, and I think mm -hmm. it's my favorite movie, period, is um, <laughs> Julie Andrews. And guess what? Mary Poppins. <laughs> guess what? Mary Poppins. Mary Poppins. I love Mary Poppins. I love the songs. I love talking to Richard Sherman about the songs that they write and, and all the rest of the things that they go on. But that seems to just do it for me. And <clears throat> so if there was a character that I would love to do, it would be Mary Poppins. That's my other character. Uh, if I may, I'll tell you a quick story. I want to make sure of the time here. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I um, what, what are you dressed as? The crocodile? It's just a dinosaur costume. Never smile at a crocodile, ever. <laughs> Not the crocodile. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was... No, I'm, I'm, I'm going to wait and tell you that story in a minute. Next question. Oh, uh, um, hi, Tinkerbell. Uh, hi there. You don't get to say that every day. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, oh, your laugh's adorable. Okay. Um, so I was just kind of curious. You say you don't look back, but looking forward, have you taken the time to, to, to have the perspective to see the impact this movie and your character has had for so many generations and so many generations to come and how, I mean, you're... Well, you just brought up what the, the quick story I was going to tell you because, and I'll, I'll go along with it right now, it'll give you a little bit of a flavor, <clears throat> because many of you don't even think of the fact that there was no reason why anybody should even know who Tinkerbell is. Mm. And the reason I say that is, when Peter Pan came on the screen, believe it or not, there was one screen in a theater and you could walk in at any time you wanted and walk out at any time that you wanted. Oh, thank you, yes, that would be lovely. Um, <clears throat> so either you got the picture, saw the movie, or you didn't, right? There was no tape to play it back, there was no rerun, there was no anything. So how did anybody know who Tinkerbell was? Because I will tell you a secret. Walt Disney never made a sequel. He had been working on Peter Pan for over 16 years. That was enough. Well, he was starting a thing called a theme park. What in the world that was, nobody really knew. It was called Mickey's Village. And the people at the studio, he was paying his own money to do the theme park. And the people at the studio were getting really nervous because they knew it was going to be a failure. In fact, Walt Disney's wife thought it was going to be a failure. And they asked Roy, his brother, to tell him not to use any of the big characters like Mickey, Minnie, uh, any of those, because they licensed them. They made money off of them. And if they had anything to do with a failure, who knew? Wouldn't you have loved to have been a, a fly on the wall when he said, so you can have Mickey's Village without Mickey? <laughs> That's what oh it goodness. came down to. Well, I'll tell you, Walt Disney was not really a stupid man. He understood. So he said, and this is big, this is big, folks. Like Barney Fife says, this is a big one. He said, tell them I am bringing back Tinkerbell and Jiminy Cricket. Will that satisfy them? Oh. Yes, and when Disneyland opened, I was on every ticket, every napkin, every map, every banner. I mean, I was every place. I was much more usable than Jiminy Cricket, right? And so, but nobody noticed because it was such a great park. So Tinkerbell then came back. They needed $6 billion to finish the park, so they went to NBC, no, they went to uh, CBS, no, they went to ABC. ABC said, yes, yes, if we can have an hour show on a Sunday, then Mr. Disney did the smartest thing he ever did in his life. He said, let's have Tinkerbell open the show and let's have her take you on your adventure every week. And that's why people knew Tinkerbell all over the world. I was told by a, 
an executive about three weeks ago that she is recognized in Outer Mongolia. You are looking at a icon, folk. <laughs> Thank you for that Thank question. <laughs> yes. Hi, Tinkerbell. Hi there. Um, I had a question about the whole production process when you were filming. Um, when you were acting, did they have you acting to an instrumental or any music at all, or was it just you? None whatsoever, but then I'm very rhythmic because of being a dancer, so it followed. And if you notice, her, all, most of her music is all Irish. So, you know, and I love the Irish jig, and I know all of those. So um, it was in my head. It was in my head, and I think there was a, a song that I sang, but I can't remember in my head what it was. But it just worked for her, you know? She's, she's so cute. <laughs> so, um, no playback whatsoever. Okay. Just, oh. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. Hi, Tinkerbell. Hello there. <laughs> um, my question is, what was your favorite scene of Tinkerbell? Like, what was your favorite part of doing of her when modeling? Say again. What when was modeling of Tinkerbell, what was your, like your favorite part of modeling of of her? My favorite part of modeling was my paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. But she was such fun, and you know you could pose and and hey, it was something. There were all men on the on this crew because they never would hire a woman to be on the crew, and I'm walking around looking pretty darn cute. <laughs> and I must tell you that at Disney. A woman or a young lady was always protected. Mark Davis would not allow any nonsense on the set at all. Catherine Beaumont, who did Wendy and did Alice, I was chatting with her one time, and she said she felt protected in the same way. So we could sort of strut our stuff and not worry too much about whether boys would say, oh, what is going on there? So I guess the freedom to be her I never thought of that before. I wasn't me. I never thought of that before. That's wonderful. I was free to be her. Yes, yes, thank you for that question. Thank you. <laughs> okay. um, hi, um, if you could be any of the other characters, um, who would you be, and Peter Pan, who would you be? Any other character in Peter Pan? I'm afraid I would go towards um, Mrs. Darling. Uh, she, there's something about her. Mark Davis also drew Mrs. Darling. So I guess that there is that flavor between. But I love the way that she just quiets her husband. How many of you know that, that Mr. Darling and Captain Hook are the same character? You know, a lot of people don't. I'm, I'm always sort of amazed at that. And think of that psychologically. <laughs> Why uh, James M. Barry did that because of one, you know, the, the father. And then uh, as Hook, Mrs. Hook's baby boy. <laughs> I love that one. So I would think Mrs. Darling, because she had everything under control, at least she thought she did, and she had a heart. She really had a heart. She was just heartbroken when the children were gone. And I, I sort of related to that, because I have three kids of my own, and I have seven great-grandchildren. That's a bunch. <laughs> Any, anyway, thank you for thank that you. question. Hello, Tink. Hello. <laughs> um, I have two questions, if it's okay. Um, one of them is, did you ever meet Bobby Driscoll and Catherine Bermont? Ah, I worked with Bobby Driscoll. You saw me dancing on the tabletop? Well, he was my brother in that movie, so we knew each other. <clears throat> but... Did it ever bother you that Bobby Driscoll's voice in Peter Pan doesn't have an English accent? Did it ever occur to you? I mean, it's so amazing. Everybody else has an English accent except Bobby. He couldn't do it. And yet this young man, I don't know whether you knew this, was given an Oscar Junior for his great acting in the pic picture, I think it was called Windows. Uh, and he was like 11 years old. He was a very lonely little boy. When I graduated on the set, if you, if you knew Susie and didn't have to go to the schoolroom, he asked me if I could come every once in a while and bring a book or something so he wouldn't be alone there. Um, 
there was, but talent, oh my. And the, um, Catherine is the one that you asked about. Catherine is a kick in the head. You know that she was a school teacher. You knew that, did you not? She was a second grade school teacher for 30 years. And she would never tell anybody new that she had everything to do with Disney. That was her business, thank you very much. The man <laughs> she married did not know, dated her for six months before she, he, he even knew that she had anything to do with Disney. She is charming, she is so ladylike, and she is sort of, uh, we, we go shoulder to shoulder. Uh, but a brilliant talent, but she didn't want to go any further with her career, as she said. And we were great on the plane together flying over to London. <laughs> I don't think Virgin Airlines has ever been the same. <laughs> and, and you had a... Uh, yes. How do you feel about Captain Hook still? Captain Hook. Uh, well, here we go. That's a good question. Because... When you read the un, unabridged um, James M. Barry book, you will find it's quite dark. As so many of the um, fairy tales from Europe. I mean, look at what happens to the two ugly sisters for Cinderella, really, at the, at the original story. I mean, those birds were not happy birds who pecked them to death. Uh, so we... We had to uh, change and soften so many of the things, and I can't remember what your question was, but then I'm 86, so you give me some slack, right? <laughs> uh, you wanted to know? Uh, about Hook, like how about, you still feel about, about it. About Hook. So this was a problem when uh, I, I know that, that Ollie Johnson and, uh, was talking about it. He said, how do you make this man happy? Well, you know, um, Ali and the other fellow, his, his partner, actually animated those two characters side by side, uh, which is so unusual. And they thought up all the jokes. And then they got Hans Conried to overdo everything. And that made him a comic character. If you read, when you read the book, you will find out he was not a comic character. He was out for blood. So they have softened it, and Disney always, and always uh, people got upset with Disney because they did that. But they had to, because we think of things in a different fashion. So thank you so much. You're welcome.